and then Hallo, ik ben Wim. Ik ben net 46 jaar geworden en ik heb ALS. Wim is a loving husband and a proud father of three teenage daughters. Wim also is an ALS patient. What started out two years ago as a weakness in his left hand has become this relentlessly progressive disease that is taking control over his body. Wim's body is slowly freezing up. So what is this terrifying disease that is affecting Wim and more than 200,000 patients worldwide? Well, it's called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS in short. It means that specific brain cells in the motor cortex and the spinal cord slowly will start to degenerate. And since it's these cells that directly link the brain to the body's musculature, the loss of these cells results in the typical paralysis and muscle wasting we see in ALS patients. Despite having the known the disease for more than 140 years, we still know surprisingly little about the complex mechanisms and causes of the disease. Hence, up until today, ALS sadly remains without a cure. So, what do we already know about the disease? Well, as for other neurodegenerative diseases, ALS is also characterized by the presence of protein aggregates in the brain of patients. And so you can see that here, in all these different neurodegenerative diseases, a different protein starts abnormally sticking together in these aggregates. And in ALS, that rogue protein is called TDP43. TDP43 is an RNA binding protein. So what are its functions? Well, the central dogma of biology dictates that in every living organism, information flows from DNA through RNA to protein. So if DNA would be a cell's instruction manual, then RNA is the message transcribed from it. And this message is subsequently converted into proteins at protein factories. And proteins are the eventual building blocks of our cells. Now, RNA binding proteins such as TDP are involved in both the generation of this RNA message and its delivery to these protein factories. All non-bacterial cells, so this includes us humans, are divided in two compartments. The nucleus, where DNA is copied into RNA, and the cytoplasm, where that RNA is converted into protein. And to keep this information flow in the cell running smoothly, it is pivotal for a cell to have a high concentration of TDP in the nucleus and a low concentration in the cytoplasm. Now, interestingly, exactly this distribution is altered in ALS patients. Normally, TDP is predominantly in the nucleus, but in ALS patients, TDP starts mislocalizing to the cytoplasm. And moreover, once in the cytoplasm, it starts sticking together in these pathological aggregates. And it's believed that both this mislocalization and aggregation are key in the death of motor neurons in ALS. So if we could better understand these two pathological events and moreover the processes underlying them, this will give us invaluable insights into the disease and will allow us to design therapeutic approaches interfering with exactly these processes. So how do we study this? Well, 90% of ALS cases are so-called sporadic cases, meaning they have no family history of the disease. Yet in 10% of cases, there is inheritance uh, from the parents to the next generation. So by studying these inheritance patterns over the generations and decoding the genome of these patients, geneticists have been able to pinpoint the exact DNA mutations causing the disease. In 50% of familial cases, all these mutations reside in one gene, the C9ORF72 gene making it the most common and most important genetic cause of the disease. Now, since we know these disease mutations, we can go back to the lab and try to study them in cell and animal models. And that's what we and our collaborators have done. We have introduced the human C9 ORF mutation into yeast and fruit flies. And as we had hoped for, this made them sick.
Now, you might wonder why yeast and flies. Well, they are actually some of the best studied organisms on this planet. And researchers over the years have developed a vast genetic toolkit which allows us to play around with each and every individual yeast or fly gene. And that's exactly what we've done. So in the first step, we took our sick yeast with a human mutation and we crossed it with 10,000 other yeast strains where we could specifically up or down regulate one gene. And then we looked for yeast which would grow better or worse with the disease. So yeast where we cured the disease or where we made the disease worse. And the genes that were altered in these yeast we call modifier genes because they modify the toxicity of the human mutation. And these modifiers likely shed some light on which cellular functions there are perturbed in the cells due to the mutation. Of course, we wanted to confirm this in an, more, in an animal model with a nervous system, and so we resorted to the fruit fly. And intriguingly, in the fruit fly, you can actually observe neurodegeneration of the brain by looking at the fly eye externally. And the neurodegeneration under the eye is characterized by these dark spots appearing on the eye. And again, you can appreciate we found genes that made the eye look worse, so more neuro neurodegeneration, or look better, so less neurodegeneration. And what was reassuring is that the most prominent genes we identified in both yeast and the fly work converged on one pathway, namely nucleocytoplasmic transport. So we have seen that the cell is divided in a nucleus and a cytoplasm, but to keep this information flow going, of course there needs to be exchange of protein and RNA between these compartments. And it's exactly nucleocytoplasmic transport that is taking care of this process. So here you can see an orange TDP shuttling between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. So cytoplasm on the left, nucleus on the right. And once you get the mutation, as you saw here happening in red, there is an alteration to this nucleocytoplasmic transport system which will eventually result in a decreased import of TDP in the nucleus and its cytoplasmic localization. Now, we can actually compare the mechanism of how the C9 mutation induces TDP mislocalization with a traffic jam. Let's say that every car is a TDP protein. You can appreciate there is a traffic jam on the road to the nucleus, so these cars, these TDP proteins, are no longer able to get into the nucleus and hence they start building up in the cytoplasm. So this simple metaphor might indeed explain why we see in patients with the C9 mutation this TDP mislocalization. But we also know that TDP once in the cytoplasm starts aggregating. So how might this fit the model? Well, we know that car accidents often happen in traffic jams simply because you have a lot of cars around. So could that be the same for TDP? Just because we have more TDP in the cytoplasm, is the protein also more prone to start sticking together abnormally? Well, to answer that question, we first have to take a step back and really define the physical changes associated with protein aggregation. So all matter can occur in three phases or material states. And here you can see the example of water. We know water as a gas, water vapor, as a liquid, plain water, and as a solid, snow or ice. So, what about proteins? Well, we know that these pathological proteins in ALS, and normal, healthy individuals, they're distributed evenly throughout the cell. So, let's say, a gas-like state. But what happens in these patients with the disease? All of a the sudden, these proteins start sticking together into these solid-like aggregates. And for years, researchers have been puzzled by how this seemingly sudden switch occurs until recently. We, we and numerous groups around the world have found that these ALS-related proteins can take up a liquid state. And this liquid state seems essential from getting the protein from the soluble gas-like state to the insoluble solid-like state, which causes the disease. And so what we, in fact, have known for years is that these RNA-binding proteins associated with ALS, such as TDP, have this intriguing switching behavior under times of stress. So at the bottom, you can see cells which, human cells which are happy. So they are in normal conditions, and these RNA-binding proteins are diffusely present throughout the cell. However, if we now stress these cells, you can see these protein blobs appearing. And for years, we thought they mimicked 
the protein aggregates in patients. However, there was one main difference. These are reversible. So if we remove the stressor from the cells, these blobs just disappear. So these are not like solid aggregates. There is something going on. Now, if we make a movie of these cells and track these protein blobs over time, you can appreciate they are far more dynamic than we initially anticipated. If you watch closely, you will even see some of these small blobs fusing together in larger ones. And this is definitely not solid behavior. Take two ice cubes, push them together, and you still have two ice cubes. You won't magically get a big ice cube. So what is really going on here? Well, compellingly, when we extract these proteins from the cells and study their behavior in a test tube, we observed very similar things. In the bottom, you can see these two test tubes. And we can make the protein switch between a clear state and a cloudy state. So if in the test tube, if we increase the protein concentration gradually, all of a sudden we reach a threshold, and then the solution goes into this cloudy stage. And now when we took this cloudy sample and monitored it on the microscope, we saw again these protein droplets forming, which we had seen in living cells, which over time fused together in bigger droplets. And since we now could recapitulate this process in a test tube, this allowed us to do biophysics and other experiments that confirm to us that these droplets are truly behaving as liquids. So this might sound as a very complex and exotic process, but it's actually one we encounter in our daily lives. Mix oil and water together, shake them up, and you will see small oil droplets which will fuse together to bigger ones over time. One could argue that my research at the moment situates itself at the intersection of ALS and the physics behind your vinaigrette or salad dressing. Now, what was good about this very simple test tube model is that we could ask ourselves one more question. What is the effect of the CNN and ORF disease mutation on this process? Well, we have done this, and you can see that in the normal control situation, these protein droplets will fuse together to bigger ones over time, showing they indeed behave as liquids. If we add a control protein, not much is happening. However, when we add a toxic protein that is only found in patients carrying the C9-ORF mutation, this picture is completely changed. All of a sudden, these protein droplets have lost their liquid-like behavior. So the disease mutation makes these liquid dynamic protein droplets freeze up into solid aggregates, seeing we, which we also see in patients. And we indeed think that exactly this process, the freezing from the liquid to the solid state, is what really underlies protein aggregation in ALS patients. So in conclusion, we and numerous labs and collaborators uh, from across the world have shown that the C9-ORF mutation can induce TDP pathology, which is considered the driver of neurodegeneration in ALS. And why is this so important? Well, for the first time ever, we have been able to pinpoint the exact molecular changes underlying this pathology. So in the first step, the C9-ORF mutation induces nuclear traffic jams, which will make TDP accumulate in the cytoplasm. And there, the C9-ORF mutation delivers a second hit by making the liquid form of TDP freeze up into this solid, toxic state. Now, although these processes have only recently been described in the last two years. Already, labs around the world are testing drug-like compounds which could interfere with this process. And we hope that this, in these scientific breakthroughs indeed might have therapeutic potential for patients. However, what these recent developments already have shown us is that we still know surprisingly little about the complex biology underlying human disease and that we must keep on stressing the pivotal importance of fundamental basic research to the advancement of human medicine. Only by truly understanding the origins of ALS, we will be able to come up with new th uh, therapeutic approaches which will allow us to tackle the disease. A disease that still, up until today, holds thousands of patients in its icy freezing grip. Now, two years ago, just as a horrible protein TDP, Wim's body started freezing up. Two years ago, we also teamed up with ALS patients to raise awareness and funds for ALS with the Ice Bucket Challenge. This year, we once more accepted their challenge. 
like Beatles in the city Be back immediately to confiscate the money As long as there is research on ALS, there is hope for ALS patients. Help us keep the research moving. Thank you. <laughs>